right, so if you haven't already done so, please check your audio now, and um, hopefully you can all hear me real well. I have a brand new headset today, and I'm hoping not to be plagued by some of the technical issues I had during last week's webinar. And you can check your audio um, by running the audio setup wizard in the tools menu. All right, so um, today we have five steps to an accessible syllabus. And I'd like to welcome you all to our seventh and final webinar of the 2015 IGNIS series. I'm so sad that it's our last one for the year, but we'll be back again next year. We're so thrilled to have you all join us today. IGNIS is the Latin word for spark or ignite, and that's exactly what we're hoping to do today, is to ignite your curiosity and to expose you to opportunities for new understanding, understanding and gaining new knowledge. This series is brought to you by SBCTC eLearning and Open Education and the Assessment Teaching and Learning Offices. And today your hosts are myself, Alyssa Sells, and my partner in crime, Jennifer Wetham. Many of you probably know us. And I am an e-learning program administrator for the State Board, and Jennifer is the program administrator for faculty development at the State Board. As you know, Jennifer and I are very fond of experimenting in these webinars, so we're going to continue our exploration of using the keyboard shortcuts in Collaborate today. And a list of short shortcuts is located in the Help menu. Funny thing about that, though, is I haven't figured out how to get into the Help menu using a shortcut yet, so I'm going to put that one in my Still Learning category. But if you do click on the Help menu in the upper left corner of your screen, you will get, uh, and then click on Keyboard Shortcut, you will get um, a list of shortcuts there. So um, feel free to try those as we're going through. I did put some prompts in the slides as well. So today is our second ever captioned webinar. Mm -hmm. And um, we would like to thank Internet Broadcasting Services Unlimited for genu generously partnering with us to sponsor our live captioning service for today's event. So thank you very, very much. And um, we're looking forward to probably doing some more captioning, um, hopefully all of our webinars next year. So learning experience for us here, too. Um, let's see, I've got a slide to show you how to enable your captions. So if you would like to activate the captions window and show those, um, that's in the top right corner of the audio video panel. And there's a little CC icon there. If you're using your mouse, you can click on that with your mouse, and a little window will pop up. And if you want to try it without your mouse, uh, click on Control F8 to open that window, and you can use Control W to close the captioning window. So um, give those a try and see what happens. So we're excited to offer this webinar series to you, and we have an excellent presenter today, as usual. We love all of our presenters, and Jennifer will introduce her shortly. But before we start, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Amy for sharing her knowledge and her experience with us this afternoon. Um, she's done a fabulous job working in accessibility over the last year with an FLC, that's a faculty learning community that she was involved with at Shoreline, so it's really great that they're sharing this information out to us. And um, just to let you know, a little later in the webinar, you're going to need to access your syllabus. And um, if you don't have a syllabus handy, uh, any other Word document will do, just something you can practice with. And if you don't have one, no worries. Amy has provided you with one. When you logged in, you should have been prompted to download a practice syllabus. So um, go ahead and open one of those documents. Doesn't matter which one it is. Um, just go ahead and get that open on your desktop so that you're ready to uh, participate in the activities when they begin. All right, as a reminder, this session will be recorded, and you can access the recording on the ATL blog, and this is just a screenshot of the blog page, and I'm putting the link to the blog in here, too. And just go to the, the IGNIS drop-down menu, and you can click on the 2015 webinar recordings, and you'll find all of the slide decks, the recordings, the webinar um, survey link, and any additional resources uh, we had for each webinar will be posted there. So just wanted to remind you um, all how to get there. So let's get started by running through just a few of the Collaborate tools and doing a few little group activities, and then Jennifer will introduce our presenter to you. All right, so here is our meeting interface. Most of you are familiar with this. And to move between these interfaces without using your mouse, you can use your tab key. 
We've got an audio video panel upper left. The participants panel is in the middle. Chat on the lower left. And then um, to your right is the whiteboard. And in the very middle there, there's a skinny little uh, toolbar. And that is for um, use on the whiteboard. We will be using that in just a minute. All right, so here are some participant tools. Um, for those of you that have attended webinars before, you'll see that I've added some things to the slides here. I've put in the keyboard shortcuts. I do not expect you to remember all of these. I can't even remember all of them. I, I did test them today, so hopefully I do have all these right. Um, but if you want to raise your hand, you can click Control-R. Uh, the polling option we are going to use in just a minute. Those are Control-1, Control-2, Control-3, and Control-4 for A, B, C, D, and E. If you're on a Mac, um, it's usually um, Command and then the same um, number or letter as the Control key. So um, give those a try as we're going through here. We are going to ask you to use those in just a minute. All right, here's the chat window. To get to your chat without um, using your mouse, you can use Control-M, and that will pop your cursor right into the text box there, and you can type away. Go ahead and type questions as we're going or comments as we're talking. All right, so um, we're coming to our whiteboard tools. And this is another tool that I have not figured out yet how to get into and use without um, my mouse. So we are going to go ahead and use um, the mouse to do this activity. I'd like you to look in the very center there and find um, the sun icon. Go ahead and hover and click over that. And then you can pick any of those um, little pointer tools. I'm going to pick the smiley face. Please go ahead and practice on this slide. If you can see, I just put a smiley face in there. So if you'll all um, give it a practice here, we're going to use this on the next slide. Great. Looks like you guys have the hang of it. So I'll just go to the next one. All right, so here's our activity. Jen and I like to um, take this opportunity to see where everybody is. We did expand our map. It used to be just Washington. And um, now we're using a map of the United States. So. Uh, go ahead and tell us where you're at. Pretty soon we're going to need a map of like the world. The world. I know. Wouldn't that be awesome if we had to have a map of the world? Who can we recruit to um, attend while they're on vacation <laughs> somewhere fun like the Bahamas? That'd be or awesome. <laughs> That'd be great. All right. So a whole cluster of us in Washington today. So um, thanks for joining us. And is us. that somebody from right, Utah, or, or is that just a piece on the map? Oh, I think it's just a glacier or a okay. lake or something. It's Sorry, it's a great lake. Yeah, somebody had plunked in Wyoming, and now they're in Oregon. So um, I'm going to say we've got mostly Washington and um, one person from Oregon today. But yeah, nobody outside our, our, our area there. OK, so um, as usual, we start our webinar with a, a poll. We like to just um, get kind of a status check of where you guys are at with certain things. So our question today is, Rate the accessibility status of your online course content. Are you A, done, exclamation point? Are you B, halfway there? Are you C, just beginning? Or are you D, that's the summer's project? And a reminder, if you want to use the um, control keys to get in there, um, those are there for you. And I can read those out in just a second. I'm just noticing that I forgot to change the poll to an ABC polling type. So hold on just one sec. I'll get that done. All right, you guys should be able to vote now. A is Control-1, B is Control-2, C is Control-3, and D is Control-4. So I'm going to say probably, I'm going to say C on mine. Looks like most of you have voted. So I'm going to go ahead and publish those results. And let's see um, where we're at. So lots of nuns, um, a few that have gotten started, um, a couple that are done. So let's um, give some applause to the folks that are done. Just clicked on my um, applause button there. So yay if you're all done. And um, also yay to you if you're not done because you're here and you're wanting to learn more. Uh, who raised their hand? Did it looks like it was who? Dawn uh, okay. from Bellingham Tech. Go ahead, Dawn. Oh, me. Oh, she said, sorry, wrong <laughs> button. OK, no worries. No See how attentive we are? No worries. All right. Your hand is up. Okay, we're going to move on from our pool. 
Okay, th I think we're good to go. All right, so just a little bit of meeting etiquette here. Um, please raise your hand when you'd like to speak, and um, we'll call on you in order. That just helps us keep questions in the queue. Uh, feel free to use the emoticons to express approval or applause. Oh, no. or there's a whole bunch of fun stuff in there. Um, I did just put the one for the smiley face here. That's Alt um, plus number one. Uh, the talk button, click that talk button when you want to talk. If you don't actually click the button, we won't hear you. And then um, the chat window again is Control M. And normally we ask you to hold your questions until we get to the end. But because we're going to be working on some things during the presentation, we're going to go ahead and have you ask questions while we're going because they'll be relevant to the section that we're on. And um, if you have other comments and stuff, though, please feel free to go ahead and type those into the chat. Looks like Amy might be having trouble with her mic. So, I'm back. Um, yeah. Oh, you're back now. OK. I saw a delay on it. I was going to hand it off to Jen, and I thought, oh, no, nope, Amy's not there. All right, so um, I'm going to hand this over to Jen now and let her introduce Amy, and then we'll get going. All right, so um, I usually I do a more formal introduction, you know, like Amy has a Bachelor's of Science in Hotel Administration from Cornell University and a Master's in Public Health and Nutrition from the University of Washington. But I really want to talk about Amy today as a change agent and in shifting the paradigm, in shifting um, just a major, well, paradigm, in paradigm shifting. As we all know, you know, we're here because we believe in accessibility. We're here because we believe in designing classrooms for maximum accessibility for all students. But when it comes to the work, the labor, creating new workflows around that, and really helping a large number of faculty and other instructional specialists make the enormous amount of change on a micro level that it takes to make the macro. Amy is just a leader. She's a visionary. Um, Amy, I, I feel a little bit overwhelmed even trying to talk about the work that you've done and the scale and the scope in which you've done it. But you're truly, in, you inspire me. You make me believe in change, that change can happen. Um, she's going to talk a lot today about her work in faculty learning communities as a leader. And I really think that when we're talking about the slow kind of work, the mentorship that it takes to make these, like, all of these tiny little shifts that add up to a lot of work, Amy's just really, really good at empowering faculty to make those changes in safe ways that really serve them and really serve our students. So, Amy. Thanks so much. We're so honored to have you here today. And I'll stop talking and let you take it away. OK, well, thank you. That was an amazing introduction, Jen. Um, very flattered. Thank you. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining today for this webinar. Um, this work came out of our faculty learning community that we had here at Shoreline this past academic year. And um, when we were looking at goals for how to, you know, what do we want to accomplish from this faculty learning community? I mean, I had like 29 goals, and everyone was like, hey, let's narrow it down a bit. So happily, everyone was more sane than I am and um, really decided that, gosh, every faculty member has a syllabus. Every student needs to access a syllabus. What a great place to start you know, dipping our toes in that pool of accessibility, because it can be so overwhelming. And um, so we decided, we did a lot of research during the year, and kind of it all culminated with these five steps to making an accessible syllabus. And the beauty of it is the things we're going to do today to the syllabus, or the syllabi, um, are applicable to any kind of Word document. Um, in Canvas, if you're creating um, pages, this is all applicable. So it's a really great first step. So, um, and I want to thank, obviously, this isn't just my work. This is from my whole um, faculty learning community group um, who's done amazing work this year. Um, so, uh, well, let's get that. All right, so let me, let me get control of these slides. Um, all right. 
So um, one thing that came, I got my little fun going on here. Okay, so uh, one thing that came out of our work, um, thanks to help from Jennifer at um, SBCTC, was we were able to create a resource classroom that is self-enroll and it works well and it's smoothly. Um, so I'm showing you the address right now of how to get there. So it's resources.instructure.com forward slash enroll and then 7PLHT4. And I'm going to have it on the last slide as well, so you don't have to scramble to write that down. But this is a great site. It's where we're putting all kinds of great resources that we found during the year. Um, and it's open to anyone, really, but it's certainly open to the whole state. Um, I haven't checked recently, but we have about 50 people in there, and a couple keep adding every day. Um, and I try to really um, limit my use of the announcements feature, but when something newsworthy or really large happens in the world of um, higher ed and accessibility, I will send an announcement out, and it's great because it goes out to everyone um, across campuses. So um, it's just a great resource. I strongly encourage you to join it and share um, with your fellow faculty, administrators, whoever on campus is interested. So really quickly, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but um, you know, why is it important? Why do we need to think about the accessibility of our online content? Well, there's lots of federal laws. I mean, we could talk about social justice, we could talk about equity um, and serving students, but the real sticking point is it's the federal law. So the law is a little unclear. Um, parts of the uh, instruction comes out of three federal laws, um, the IDEA law, Title II of ADA, and Section 504 of the Rehab Act, and a little bit of Section 508 as well. I'm not an expert on those laws, just going to say they're out there, and that's really what we're having to pull, um, pull what we want to do as higher ed online from those laws. And those laws weren't written with higher ed online content in mind, they were written um, to help students in K-12, they were written to help people with physical disabilities, you know, have curb cuts and elevators, and so a lot of it is still interpretation. So we're doing the best we can given the kind of murky guidance we're given. Um, the one thing that is clear is that the federal government is very, very interested and in expecting that we all accommodate for sensory disabilities. So these are specifically vision and hearing. Um, you know, there's many other kinds of disabilities. There's physical disabilities. There's learning disabilities. Um, but those aren't what are um, required by these laws. So that's why we're kind of focusing today on um, mostly vision. Um, but that's not to say the others aren't important. But there's a whole other year for that FLC. So we'll get there. Um, so it looks like we have another poll, Alyssa. Yeah, I mean, this is the one we built in at the beginning, so you can actually skip this slide and keep going. Oh, no, no right. worries. No, I, I just, um, I forgot to pull it out, so um, yeah. just go ahead and keep going. I will keep going. Okay, so what does accessible mean? Some people have no idea, some people have different ideas, um, but I think the important idea to keep in mind is the one that the U.S. Department of Justice and the U.S. Department of Education are using, because they are the ones who are bringing lit litigation against colleges for not being accessible. So um, it's really a person with a disability must be able to obtain the information as fully, equally, and independently as a person without a disability. That's very, very high standard. Um, it's something to aim for, uh, but that's high. So we need to keep that in mind as our ultimate goal. Um, let's see. So I think you've probably all been hearing the news lately that they have been taking litigation legal action against um, higher ed institutions. In February, um, Harvard and MIT are sued over lack of having closed captions. Um, and just last week or the week before, um, Miami University was being sued by a blind student, and the federal government decided to jump on their suit and join suit with the student to sue the college for um, not being able to effectively accommodate disabled students. So that's pretty scary because it's becoming more and more prevalent. It's, it's a real thing. And I think probably you're all here because you're aware of this. Um, but it's always good to remember the ultimate reason why. So OK, here's another poll. How's that, Alyssa? Yeah, that's fine. Um, so our poll is, have you ever heard a screen reader reading a document? A is yes, and B is no.
All right, looks like we've got lots of folks voting, so I'll go ahead and publish those. There we go. So um, lots of folks have, actually, um, which is interesting because I hadn't heard uh, a screen reader read until I attended the retreat that your FLC hosted. I had always been curious about that. So um, it's nice to see that so many folks have um, familiarity with that process. Yes, that is great. Um, and so now, for those of you who haven't, and even if you have, um, we're just going to take a couple minutes to watch a video. Um, this gentleman, Neil Ewers, I think his name is, um, he does a really good job of a quick overview of what it's like to be a blind person trying to navigate um, a computer. And I think we decided we're going to put the YouTube link in the chat window, guys, and that we decided. Um, so you yeah. can actually click on it and watch it on your own computer. And then we're going to set a timer for about three and a half or four minutes. Because um, the video is about seven minutes, but let's just watch the first three and a half so you get a sense of what he's doing. And then the timer will ring and you'll come back to the Collaborate screen. Is that right? Yep. I'm going to set the timer for four minutes. And Jen or Amy, do you have that link handy? Um, I don't, but I can grab it. Hold on. Um, I forgot to get it pulled up before we started, so I did. It. that'd be great, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Uh, I can get it. It's hold on. Uh, let me see. Oh, it's too long to type. Here, Amy. Uh, vision disabilities. Sorry yeah. about that, folks. I thought yeah. we were all ready to go. Yeah, my apologies, too. I, okay. Here it is. I got it. Awesome. Okay, and I've got the timer, that. so um, as soon as you get the link posted in, I will. And are we going to have them watch the, it's seven, the one that I'm, sh that I just posted is seven minutes, so Amy, where do you want them to start in it? Um, start at the beginning and go to, to minute 3.5. Start at the beginning and go, I'm just typing that in the chat window, until two okay. minutes and 35 seconds. Three okay. minutes. Sorry, three minutes. Sorry, three, three minutes. 50 seconds. 30 seconds. 3.30. Yep. And then come back when you hear the ding. So Jen, I'll pass right. that into the chat, and all you need to do is click the link in the chat, and it will auto-open in your browser. Or if you already have a browser open, you can copy the link and um, paste it in. All right, so there it is. And uh, Alyssa, you can go ahead and set the timer. OK, I got it. Thanks, guys. No worries. I hope it's the right video. <laughs> it is. I just checked it. It looks good.
right, folks, that was the timer. So if you haven't already returned to the webinar room, um, come on back. Hopefully you all had a chance to uh, watch the, the whole three and a half minutes. And we're going to let Amy keep going. OK. Thanks for watching that. I hope that worked for you. Um, so we are curious, especially if you've never seen the screen reader before, kind of what's your general reaction to um, what he was showing you and the challenges that there are um, for a person who cannot see and having to use screen readers and such. So you can put that in the chat, but we need to keep going because I don't want to run out of time here. Um, so we have another poll. Um, please rate your current level of comfort creating accessible documents. Um, a, totally comfortable, I've got this. B, I'm good at some parts, but have more to learn. Or C, I'm so overwhelmed, I don't know where to begin. So go ahead and vote. I'm going to vote too. All right, I'll go ahead and publish those results. Okay, get your last minute votes in. Okay, publishing. All right, so a lot of us are good at some parts but have more to learn. I definitely put myself in that category. And um, even I still sometimes feel really overwhelmed and still am not sure what I should do first. So, yeah, I, I think actually, that's common. Yeah, <laughs> I feel that way too because there's so much there's so many different ways you can look at it, and there's so many ways you can design for different disabilities. Um, I feel like it's going to be a lifelong process. So don't, don't fear if you're feeling stressed, because we all do. Um, but we're here to make this a little bit easier. Um, so today, we're going to take that first step, and we're going to help you make your course syllabus accessible. And if you don't have a course syllabus because you're not actually an instructor, whatever document you might be working on. Um, because what, what we're going to teach you today is stuff that you should just apply every time you make a Word document from now on um, so that it's always going to be accessible no matter who your audience is. So let's get going. So there's five easy steps. Um, some of these may sound familiar, some may not. Um, but we want you to use headers and styles in your document. And we'll obviously cover that in a second. Um, alt text for any graphics that you have. Um, using hyperlinks that are descriptive, um, and we'll go into that. Using true bulleted and numbered lists, and making sure you label your tables, which is a mouthful, but it's very important. All right, so first off, we're going to talk about headers and styles. So anytime you're creating a document, you always want to use the styles. And I didn't know what these were probably a year ago. Um, I've already seen um, this kind of thing hanging out at the top of your Word. Uh, folder, you know, your word sheet you're working on, and I didn't really know what they were. And so really what it means is instead of just typing and going, oh, it's my title, let me make it, uh, I don't know, font size 24, and let me bold it and make it um, purple. Instead, this is a way of you, you, you designate it, basically. You apply this label of title here, and you, that way the computer and a screen reader will know that this is the title. So they can say, title, you know, syllabus for class 101. Um, and that way, the screen reader knows what it's getting. If you don't use these styles to designate the kinds of text that are in your document, all the screen reader is going to be able to do is read it from t left to right, top to bottom, word for word. When you have these styles in there, it forms a sort of organization for your document so that someone on a screen reader can tab through They'll hear a title, they might hear a subtitle, and then they'll hear heading one, and then, some, then they'll have the option of listening to the text in heading one, or they can skip to the next heading one, and that sort of gives them a layout of how you built your document. Um, and we're going to go and do a little example here. Um, and this is just actually within Canvas, exact same thing. Um, the headers, they're called headers in Canvas, and here they are. You know, I've highlighted the title or the subtitle, basically, of this syllabus in Canvas, and it's designated as header two. So I want you guys to give that a try on your own syllabus. Um, I'm going to try and screen share. Haha, <laughs> let's see if this works. Um, a syllabus that I have, and I will show you. Oh, maybe I didn't select it. Hold on. 
Share Microsoft Word. Let me see. Oh, can you see it? Yep, we okay. got it, Amy. Good job. Awesome. Okay, so here is my inaccessible syllabus. I did everything possibly I could to do wrong on this. So I'm just going to go ahead and select that title. And right now, see, it's just defaulting to normal text. I don't want normal text. I want it to be my title text. So I go ahead and click on title right here. And there was a subtle change in font. Um, but most of this is happening in the background. Some of it's for us to see, but really this is helping um, HTML in the background. The spring 20, whatever it's going to be, I want that to be my subtitle. So I'm going to click the subtitle heading box. And then for my instructor, who's a cool person, and my office hours, I'm going to call those heading one, because that's important information I want to be at the top. And then textbooks and materials, you know, many syllabus, syllabi have, you know, subheadings. So textbooks, this has course outcomes, grading schemes. Those are kind of like almost like chapter headings or chapter titles. So those are all also going to be heading one on my document. And as you notice, it changes into whatever this font setup is here in this heading. And I will say, I really hate that the default is light blue. It makes it look like links. I think that's very confusing. Um, if you want, you can, let's put this, let's say we wanted, well, let's go to here, textbook and materials. I don't want it to be blue. I want it to stay black. And I want it to be bold, and I like the font size 16. So this is how I want all my heading ones to look, but they don't. So what I can do is with this one highlighted, this one I like, I go up now to heading one up here, and I right click, and then an option comes up to update heading one to match selection. And that way you can customize those headings to be anything you want. So visually you get the look you want, and the HTML in the background is still doing the right thing for the screen readers. So I hope that makes sense and I didn't go too quickly. Um, but that's how you use headings and styles. Are we good to go on? Any questions for Amy on this part before she moves on and teaches you another skill? I just have a comment, Melissa. Yeah. Um, the same place that you right-clicked, Amy, if you uh -huh. right-click and then, and then go to modify on your heading, if you don't like the color, click modify. Yep. You can change the color there, and then it will change it the rest of the way through your document. Yes, yes, it works in both, actually. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. So either way, whatever makes sense to you, and you can change all of it right here. So the, the font and the size, the bolding, the color, um, even look, even indentation page. And this is actually helpful, too. This is spacing. But I don't want to, because some of them have really huge spaces in between. Um, and if you do use this, you want to click that, check that little automatically update button, and then that way it will update any heading that you have in that document set at heading one for you, so you don't have to go and look for them. Awesome. Cool. Thank you, Jackie. All right. Looks okay. like we're good to move on. I didn't see any other hands go up, and I didn't see any okay. questions in the chat, Amy, so go ahead and um, okay. keep going. All right. I'm stopped sharing. I'm hoping my... PowerPoint will reappear. It's doing some. There we go. Okay. So next up is alt text. Um, this is an alternative to text. Uh, I mean, alternative to graphic in text form. So, you know, if you don't have um, any alt text and a screen reader is reading it through your document and it bumps into this thing that's an image, it's just this blank space. There's nothing there. All that the screen reader user will know is that there's some information they don't have access to. There's some sort of image there, and they don't know what it is. And so I think it's very um, alienating and very, it just feels really awful to be left out. And you don't know if that's a picture of my kid that I wanted you to see because my kid's cute, or if that is a pivotal piece of information that's going to be on the final. I mean, they really have no context at all. So what you do is you add some alt text. And so you want this to be descriptive of what you're looking at. So I had to throw cats in here, right, because internet. Um, so there's five white and red kittens in a box. So now the user knows, oh, OK, that's a picture of some kittens. Great. Um, you know, there's lots of discussion about choices of graphics in your documents. You know, hopefully they all have a purpose. Hopefully I don't just put my child up there because he's cute. You know, if it doesn't relate to the 
context of what you're learning, maybe think about whether you really need it. And then because you do need it, you need to have a good description that's going to be informative and helpful for the user. Um, so let's see. And OK, and so also, um, alt text isn't the end all be all, right? Um, I can say kittens in a box is fine, but how in the world would you go ahead and describe this image of a fractal? Let's say someone's been blind since birth. They've never seen a fractal. They don't know what that word means even, perhaps. Um, I don't know how you'd begin to describe this. Red and blue, I mean, blue and yellow swirly. I mean, I don't know. So it's just sort of a, a reminder of how challenging it can be. And even when we do our best to make accommodations, they're still not 100%. It's still not the same as being sighted or, you know, having hearing or, you know, so it's really important you do the best you can do because it's still really hard work to be someone using a screen reader or be someone, you know, reading captions. Um, and so the least we can do is to try hard on our end as well. So um, how to add alt text. Um, you go ahead and you right click on the image. And um, you're going to have a choice to format your picture on the drop down menu. You hit format picture. And then if you look on the right hand side of this document um, in Word 2013, this is what it looks like. And you click on, this is a funny little icon that means, I had to write it down because I keep forgetting, layout and properties, that little square one with the, the lines. And within layout and properties, you will find alt text. If you're using an older version of Word, it's actually easier to find. Um, but in any event, you're going to have a space for a title and a space for a description. And I've heard a variety of different people's take on what you put where. And my kind of takeaway was put the same thing in both the title and the description um, because you're not, you don't know what uh, supportive technology someone's going to be using, so you don't actually know which of these it's going to pull. And so I put it in both. And I'm still looking for more clarity on why one is, I don't know that one is better than the other, but I think it just depends on where people are accessing and what they're using to access it. So that is alt text quickly. Um, does anyone have any questions about alt text? I'll just keep moving, and then if something pops up in the chat, why don't you guys just save at me, and we'll go back. Um, descriptive hyperlinks. So Amy, we we've probably all question. done this. We do have a question about oh, good. Text. Okay. Um, Kathy sure. wants to know um, what about alt text in Canvas? Alt text in Canvas. Okay, so we're not actually doing Canvas today, but you absolutely can do it in Canvas. Um, there's two different places. When you, if you use the add image on the right hand side in Canvas and you pull images in from Flickr, they're going to come automatically when that image pops up. It's going to have a place where sometimes there's already alt text added and sometimes it's blank, but you can just type it right in there. Often the alt text that comes from Flickr is not helpful alt text. It says something like picture.jpg or a date in a JPEG. It's not descriptive at all. So you're going to want to write over that something that's helpful. If you already have the image in your document, now you can select the image and then go up to the little um, rich text editor bar, click on the little tree picture, that's the image picture, and then it's going to bring up that same screen where you'll have either existing alt text to edit or a blank space where you would edit. Is that helpful enough? It's hard to do without it in front of me, but I think I got all the steps right. Yep. I think you got it. OK. All right, so moving on to hyperlinks. Um, this is what you're not supposed to do. Please take the survey and then put in this long, 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 long link. Because a screen reader will see this as, it'll say, please take the survey, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash. It might say docs. It might say D-O-C-S dot. I don't know if it would say Google or G-O-O-G-L-E dot com. And then it will go through all these letters and numbers one by one. Not only is that painful to listen to, um, it's also meaningless. So again, you want to be descriptive. So what you really want to do is say, please take the survey. And then you want to embed that long hyperlink into the text of what it is you're linking to. 
Um, there's lots of back and forth. A lot of people say you shouldn't say click here. Um, from a disabilities perspective, correct. You shouldn't say please take the, or please click here to take the survey. The click here doesn't mean anything to a screen reader, but we've sort of come to the conclusion in our group that it's still okay to do that because you want to make sure you're serving all students. So we have um, lots of non-traditional students who are returning who haven't been on computers for 15 years. Um, we have international students. We have students with other disabilities. So what we've sort of come to is, like the second option here, more information about your project can be found here. That whole thing is a link. You can click anywhere in it. It does have here in it because some people don't realize blue text with an underline is a hyperlink. You know, uh, you can judge that based on your audience. Um, but in terms of sort of better ideas, it's good to have the link at the end of a sentence so that um, people don't click on it in the middle of a sentence. Because if I said, please take the survey, there's the link. You have to, or you know, please take the survey due on Monday at 11 p.m. They clicked on survey and they didn't even see the bit about when it was due. So try and put the links at the end and try and make them descriptive so that someone knows what that link is going to do for them. I mean, I think, I can't remember if we got far enough in the video with Neil, but he is able to pull up a whole list of links in his screen reader. And so if it was all those HTTP, it's nonsense. Whereas he could pull up a link and it would say survey, homework, discussion, and then he could choose the link that he needed to navigate to much more easily. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, another thing that's really important to do is you want to use true bulleted lists and columns. So in Word, um, I couldn't make it any bigger here in this screenshot, but you can see, you know, the little tab thing to click on to make bullets and the thing to make numbered lists. That's how you want to make numbered lists. You don't want to do number one dot space space information two dot space space because the screen reader simply reads that as those characters. If you use these um, pre-formatted bullets and numbers, it's going to say list, and then it will recognize that you're about to go through a list. And then someone has the option to skip it, or at least they have the forewarning that they're about to hear a list of something. So those work well. And same for columns. You don't want to be doing like we all learned, well, the older ones of us who took typing, um, you know, where you'd set up all those tabs, and you'd type, and you'd tab, tab, and you'd that's a disaster for a screen reader. It reads all the blank spaces as blank spaces and is very confused and it doesn't work well. So try and use these whenever you can. Um, and finally, <laughs> tables. Tables are tricky. Um, they're not great in general um, for people who are trying to use screen readers. They're hard for people to keep all that information in their head. So um, it's always important to really think through why you're using a table. So okay to use them. Um, you know, certainly a lot of science and math courses, they have to use tables. It's how you, you know, handle data. But be thoughtful about it. Um, and then when you do use a table, you want to make sure you set it up in such a way that it is as accessible as possible. So here's a couple steps to do. Um, here we have a table from a biology class. You want to highlight your top row if that's your header row. So like these are the titles for each column, characteristic, bacteria, and human cells. So you want to highlight those. And while they're highlighted, right click on them. And you're going to come up with this little menu that's going to ask for table properties. So you're going to click on table properties. We're going to go to the next slide. And this box is going to pop up. And so you want to find the tab that says alt text. And it's just like alt text for the pictures, there's space for a title and there's space for a description. And you want to go ahead, and here it's important to do a good description of what the table is about. Um, because the screen reader will hit the table and it will say table, and maybe you have a title on that table and it'll know the title. But the description enables the screen reader user to know whether that's a table they want to listen to right now or not. Um, because they're going to have to maybe listen to six column titles and, you know, nine or ten um, row titles and then all the data in the middle and maybe they don't have the 
interest or capacity or need to do that right at the moment. So this t description of this table was the characteristics of nucleus organelles and cytoplasmic membrane are compared in bacteria versus human cells. Maybe they need that information right now, maybe they don't, but now they've had the chance to have context for what these lists are going to be that their screen reader is going to read out to them. Um, and I think we get to go, oh, and then there's one more step. So that was the alt text part of the table labeling. The next part is um, you want to make sure for the rows, those are the columns, the rows, you want to repeat its header row at the top of each page. It's really important that you click this box, and I still don't have a really good explanation of why, but it is important, and it's a necessary step. So let's make sure we do that. If the ta Amy, if the table is split between two pages, then the header row automatically um, goes to the second page at the top of the table. Right. Have you ever seen a split table before in a Word doc? Oh, yeah, it's awful. Yeah. They don't do that. Yeah. So this automatically will, if it's split between two pages, it will automatically put the header row on the table for you on the second page. There you go. Um, and so, yeah, and that helps with accessibility as well. So we're going to give it a try. Um, does everyone have some sort of little table? If you don't, um, you can look at the, if you open the inaccessible syllabus that I made. Um, let me see if I can get it to share. There we go. Um, so hopefully you can see mine. Um, here I have this grading scheme. So I want to highlight that title row, the course activities and percent of grade. And I right click, table properties, and lots of options, but the very last one is alt text. And I want to put in, you know, grading scheme for nutrition 101 and a description. I don't know. This table shows the breakdown of scores or whatever. And you want to click OK. But then I want to highlight this again, actually, and right click, and then do the same thing for the rows. Repeat as header row across the top of each page. And that designates it as the headers so that the screen reader realizes those are the titles for those rows. OK, that was kind of quick, but hopefully you all got that. And I'm trying to be sensitive to time. It's getting late. Um, so a few questions we can ask them at the end as well. I'm sorry that this is going so fast. But let's see. As soon as I get my documents back. Um, all right, so we gave it a try. So other tips for documents to keep in mind. Um, these are good tips for probably most students, but particularly um, for students who might be using a screen reader, use simple language. Don't use jargon. Don't use words that they may not know the definition of. Um, I think it's also kind of a good idea for most online content is to keep it at eighth grade level and below. Um, of course, if you're in like a complicated science class or a technical class, that would be different. But for general purpose, um, avoid abbreviations. You know, spell things out. Make sure things are clear. Avoid all caps. Um, those are confusing to the screen readers, and they're kind of obnoxious, I think, too. Um, you can use color, and I know that's hard to do in Canvas, and people don't like that they don't have as much freedom in Canvas. But um, you can use color, but just be aware of when you use it, and don't use it to convey meaning. Don't have um, a document set up that says, things in green are due on Monday, and things in blue are due on Friday. Because if you can't see those colors, you have no way of knowing which ones are which. So you can use the color, and you can say, homework in blue or assignments in blue are due on Monday in this group. But you want to make sure that the meaning isn't just based on the color. If, you, if it was all black and white, you would still be able to understand what was due when. So hopefully that makes sense. And always have adequate color contrast. So you want, see right here, like the word color, it has light behind it and dark in front. That just makes it easier for people who have vision disabilities to be able to see it more clearly. Um, and um, if you forget everything I just mentioned, um, you can go into Word and you can check the accessibility of your document. 
Um, this is Word 2013 right here on the right. You're in that home sort of info menu. There's a check for issues button. You go down and there's check accessibility. You click on that and it's going to show you a list of what's wrong in your document that you might need to correct. And it's really fantastic. Often there's advice for how to fix what the problem is. So it's very fun and robust and really a good tool. This is an older version of Word. I think it's 2010. Same idea. It's on that info menu. Check for issues. Check accessibility. The only bummer about this is um, Microsoft did not build that into Word for Mac versions of Word. So I'm afraid that you can't do that there. That's a little frustrating. But that's the way it is. Um, my last thing I just want to request, and we did this at the end of the retreat, and it was pretty great. Think about all that we've just covered, um, and, and, and in thinking about accessibility for your online content, you know, set some achievable goals and include a timeline. That's my nutrition training talking. You know, you want to set a goal that you're going to succeed. You don't want to su set such a lofty goal that you're going to be stressed out and not do it. So set a small goal and put a timeline in to check up on yourself. So maybe, for example, you know, in this summer, I'm going to make the syllabi for two of my classes accessible. Or, um, or, I don't know, I put fall quarter, I will add alt text to all the images in Canvas. It's doable. You know, if you said, by fall quarter, I will have my entire class completely accessible, that's kind of a, a, a action freezer there, because it's so overwhelming. So just pick a little piece. Set it yourself a timeline and um, set it up, and I think you'll be really surprised at the results and pleased. Um, and if you're really brave, if you join that resource classroom, we have a discussion in there um, that has people with their goals that they set at the retreat. So you can put it, make it public for a little more peer pressure to see if you can actually accomplish it. Um, and it's always fun to see what people choose. So that is my talk, I think. Um, to totally open for questions. I want to make sure we leave time for that. So go ahead. How do we do that? <laughs> go ahead, Earl. So my question is, when you create a hyperlink to a word or line of text as you demonstrated, how does, how does the screen reader uh, perceive and read that? Great question. So the screen reader is going to read it as, like, see here, I put out the whole URL on this screen because I want you guys to be able to type it in. But um, pretend, um, I could highlight resources in this classroom, add a hyperlink, and what the screen reader will see is resource uh, hyperlink resource classroom. So it will identify that a hyperlink is coming and this is what it's titled, basically. Um, and then it won't give all the dot, dot, colon, slash, slash stuff. Does that answer your question? Great. Thank you. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Earl. Anybody else? I'm enjoying reading the chat window where Dawn says that she can't wait to play with some of these techniques. Yay! And where Anne said it's so nice to start with small steps. Yes. I think, I think it's true. I mean, I originally sort of became inspired by Jess Thompson when she was at Olympic College because she had an FLC on accessibility. And I went to kind of their end of the year summit training. And I just remember leaving there completely overwhelmed, didn't know where to start, completely stressed out. And I thought, gosh, if I'm feeling this way, everyone must feel this way. And this is so important. We've got to be able to make it well, accessibility accessible, if that's a ridiculous thing to say. But um, I'm glad. Yeah, small steps are great, because you feel good, too. Absolutely. Are there any other questions? Or just maybe, do people want to type in maybe one insight they have after today's uh, session? It's kind of fun to see things in the chat. A little formative assessment. Kathy mm -hmm. says tables are difficult, but I love them. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> we need to like make a you know, and then like hashtag no mouse on the back, like T-shirts. 
<laughs> the totally. soda straw viewpoint from the video was very revealing. Nice. That's a great insight. Uh, Christy's committing on Yay. on a recording, <laughs> so we have her. <laughs> uh -huh. Way to go, Christy. Christy, we're totally going to disseminate this to everyone. Yep, it's on our <laughs> record now, girl. Get it done. <laughs> Watch yeah. this only for Christy Fierro's commitment. <laughs> yeah, right. And you know, if, if you join the resource classroom and you come up with questions, it's you know, it works just like my classes where I teach my students. You know, there's if there isn't right now, I will add in a, just like a question discussion, and you can throw it out there, and it'll go to anybody who subscribed to that discussion, and I'll certainly see it. So um, I'm happy to just jump in there and share what I know or share a good resource that might answer your question. Um, so please do. And please put it on the record. That's great. Oh, Jess says you should make an accessible template with CC BY for everyone else to use. Oh, that's a great idea. All right, I'm writing that down, Jess. If I can for your non-existent spare time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's exactly. for Christy. This is, this is a <laughs> challenge for Miss Christy. Oh, there we go. <laughs> cool. All right, Many well, minds. While people finish um, typing into the chat, I'm going to go ahead and um, close us out. Um, Amy's last slide I loved, so um, she didn't get that quite this far, but she says the end, but it's really the beginning, and I completely agree because now you have tools um, to go out and do stuff with. Earl, go ahead. Yeah, can you please put that URL back up for just a second? Sure. Thank you. I need the last four characters. Mm -hmm. The most important ones. And Amy, I just want to say one more time, you know, thanks for really leveraging this Thank FLC you. to increase not just the le the learning that happened at Shoreline, but really creating so much statewide, system-wide learning. This is really, to me, the vision, the purpose, the function of the FLCs, and yep. it takes a really gifted faculty leader to to not just get that vision, but implement it and make it a reality. And I, ju I just want to say thanks again. I'm, I'm really humbled by everything that you do. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. And I think mostly it's because I didn't know any better. And I've just <laughs> jumped right in and been in everyone's <laughs> face. So um, thank you for attending. And um, it was great having that statewide retreat, which was also an accident, but um, was really wonderful. And it was great to have so many people from so many campuses there. And um, yeah, I think, and it, you know, there's power in numbers. And I think it is an overwhelming process. And the more resources we can share and the more work we can do together, the easier the burden is. It's kind of a takes a community or it takes a village. It really what, takes so. a community. Anyways, thanks, everyone, for attending today. I appreciate it. And spread the uh, word. Share that, that, share that resource <laughs> yeah. classroom share that out. Um, when you go to download um, the information from the um, blog, you'll notice in, in the presentation are some additional resources that have been included. So um, check some of those out. And I saw somebody, I think it was Mark Lentini, did you have a question? I saw your hand go up for just one sec. Maybe not. Oh, he's right. typing. He's typing. He's typing. Okay, that's fine. I'll keep going. Just a reminder, um, access um, the resources and the recording on the ATL website. And um, our contact information is in here. So if you want to contact Jennifer or I, please feel free to do so. And um, at the end of each webinar, we ask you to share about um, how we did and what you thought. So I'm going to go grab the link to that. I will paste it in the, into the chat. We would um, very much appreciate if you would um, click the link and just take just a couple minutes. I don't think it takes very long to do. And if you'll just um, give us some feedback, that will help us um, improve our webinars and to get better for next year. And i got to grab that link here. Hold on just a second. I'll get that. I'm totally getting so good at making really short surveys. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Excellent. Hopefully people are good at taking short surveys. <laughs> All right, there we go. I got it this time. All right, so there's the survey link. You can click on it right from here and go right to it, or you can find that on the ATL blog as well. And then, again, I just wanted to thank our captioning sponsor today, Internet Broadcast Services Unlimited, for um, generously donating their time and their services to us. So thank you. Big applause to them. 
And um, I'm having a little tear in my eye having to say, join us again next season. We don't have anything else coming up this season. So um, we're done for this year. And watch for a call for proposals to go out probably sometime in the fall. And thank you again so much for attending today. And I hope that you found this season to be um, interesting and fun and full of things um, that you didn't know about and got to hear about through your peers from across the state. We just have so many great people in our state. And I think it's um, really, really nice for those folks to have an opportunity to share what they know with us. So um, Jennifer, any closing comments? Um, only to say that everything that I said about Amy, I just want to say about you too. Oh. You're, <laughs> you're really teaching me a lot about how to have courage and take risks and adapt workflow to to make this huge paradigm shift. And so, thank you so much. You're an you inspiration. You're welcome. Thank you. I will confess, though, um, I'm going back to this slide because Steve just asked me to show the captioning service again, so I've gone back to their their names. Um, I will confess, though, that the, the PowerPoints for this season um, were not accessible. Uh, the last two, I did do an accessibility audit on them. Um, lots of problems. Um, so next year, I'm going to redo everything and, um, yeah, get that workflow uh, going and, and model the behavior that <laughs> we're promoting. Yay. That sounds awesome. <laughs> and Kathy says, applaud. Amen. Applaud. I don't know why I'm saying amen so much today. It's <laughs> You're feeling it, Jen. Weird. Awesome. <laughs> Just give us a cake. Yes. Yay. Yay. A cake to celebrate our season. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go ahead and close our recording, and um, we'll get that posted. Awesome. Thank All you. All right. Very fun.